Hello guys and welcome back to the Hearthstone Winter Preliminaries for Europe. I'm joined by fellow Brit Sottle and we're going to talk about the last game, Sixo versus Gladiol. That was quite an intense game for Sixo and one thing I want to tap into is your experience as a player like Sixo who has a lot riding on his shoulders as expectations go. How does it feel to be in that hot seat and losing to a player you don't really know much about? Sure. I think I think Sixo has a little bit more weight of expectation on his shoulders than I do, but um, I've definitely had the experience at um, the Gfinity Major I played in, where um, I went through a lot of players like Powder, Faramir, etc., people I was expecting to lose to, and then got into a position against an unknown guy called Zosus, where it was like, well, okay, well now you've you've seen off these pros, you know, you've beaten these big names. You're kind of expected now to go on and beat this guy as well. And it kind of flips it on his head when you suddenly uh, become the favorite. But for Sixo, he goes into most matches as the favorite. And what that means is just making sure his preparation is as solid as it can be for everyone, making sure he takes every game completely seriously. And I think we definitely saw him do that in the last set. You guys touched on his lineup and how it looked like he was targeting uh, Secret Paladin. And then he went into that freeze mage versus Secret Paladin in the first game. And that owl just ruined everything. That just destroyed his strategy. Uh, how do you think Sixo felt when he saw that owl? Do you think his, do you think he was tilted a little bit that his whole overall strategy had been kind of destroyed by a single owl? I think he mentioned in the interview with Dan actually that he was really worried after that point because you know, he said his lineups felt like they should have been really favored. So it seems like that was a strategy he had out in mind. And like you said, something as simple as just adding an Iron Beak Owl to deal with a Doomsayer can swing that match up completely on its head because if that Frost Nova Doomsayer had gone off, that match is completely different. So. So looking at the Warlock versus the Face Shaman, mm -hmm. there was a situation, especially in the opening hands with six, so it looked really bleak for him. And then he made a decision to go face with the two uh, taunted up minions. And that kind of threw the game uh, for in his favor because he had the, you know, the presence of mind to say, right, I need to win this game. Uh, that is, I think, a core fundamental of being an aggro player. Do you think if, if he didn't take that line of play, he would have just lost? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a key turn. He got to attack for 10 that turn, which is just a third of the health. And as you identified, um, beating aggro is not just about stopping them from killing you. You have to kill them. It's what a, a matchup against a, a face deck is. It's a constant race. You can't just keep clearing their stuff and giving them turn after turn because they will draw damage more consistently than you do. So you have to activate the race with whatever cards that you have. Um, it's kind of why a, a deck like Druid is so good at doing that because they have the threat of Savage Roar all the time. But um, Sixo was able to activate that kind of situation with such a poor zoo hand and seal the game. So extremely well played from him. Thank you very much, Sotl. So we have Tice coming up versus It's Me, David C, or Dave C, sorry. I'm going to go to the desk with Frodan and the guys, and they're going to bring you that match right now. Thank you very much, Nick and Simon, or Alcobla and Sotl. I got to get the to call them by their proper, proper names. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome back to the Winter Europe Preliminaries. My name is Frodan. I am joined on the caster desk by Daniel D2 Akuda, as well as Yanni Savitz Mikkonen. People are very familiar with Savitz, so we'll get to him in just a second. I wanted to get to know the newcomer, D2. How are you doing? How's it feel to be here casting the European Preliminaries? Frodan, I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Being here, being able to cast the European Preliminaries. I mean, I'm surrounded by Frodan and Savitz. What could be better? Well, you got really good looking all of a sudden, that's for sure. I mean, you're dressed up, you're wearing a tie, uh, really up showing us because they were like, ah, we should probably dress up. I, I just decided to become in my clown costume today. <laughs> Savit, you're looking pretty sleek as usual. How are you doing? Doing great. Really excited about this event. Last year was amazing with the World Championship. We're going to have Thais coming back. He's the European champion. He's top four finisher. We're going to see him go against this new guy. And uh, Xixo had a tough time with an unknown player. We'll see how Thais is going to do. It feels like the competition in general just keeps leveling up every single year. Uh, people talk about Firebat's amazing run in 2014, it was, and even Oskaka's run in 2015. But, you know, in, in this year, next year, even in the coming years of Hearthstone, hopefully we continue to extend the life that long. It's going to be increasingly more difficult because people get better, information is out there, and the players are also continuing to develop. We have 40 million registered players in Hearthstone. You're bound to have an increasingly top-heavy competition where it just becomes more challenging to win it all. Yeah, exactly. So many players are playing right now, and even in Japan, where the server, or basically where I live right now, the client just came out last October. They're playing so much. So many more players are playing there as well. And like you said, pl players are just getting better and better as mm -hmm. the seasons go on. So much better than, I mean, two years ago even. Now, we talk about how good these players are, and everyone knows about Tice, but how much do we know really about this Romanian player? It's me, David C. 
Well, other than the fact that he has really good rhyming skills. Well, we know his classes, and he's bringing uh, what looks like to be a, a little bit more aggressive lineup than the one that Thais is bringing. It's me, David C., with that Shaman. Shaman usually, when we see the class, is, is being played as an aggressive uh, strategy with those tunnel drugs from League of Explorers, all the face burn spells with Crackle, Lava Burst, all that stuff, and the other decks are likely to be Paladin, it's likely to be aggressive, Secret Paladin, and the Warlock probably Zoo. Yeah, this is really interesting to me because I see a couple of choices here that are very unique. First of all, Ty's choosing to ban Shaman of all classes, which Shaman's already not played very often, and now we're going to just be deprived of it even more, so thanks, Tys. The second thing that sticks out to me is, you know, we saw the Warlock ban on the other side, allowing Tys to keep some of the most powerful classes. Warrior, one of them, his Patron Warrior specifically, is very good. And also keeping the Paladin. It seems like no one is intent on banning Paladin yet. Why do you think that is, you 2 I mean, Paladin, usually you go in wanting to be able to deal with Paladin rather than having to ban it out because it's such a, a flexible class. You know, you need to be able to deal with something like that at some point. And, you know, those bans seem pretty standard to me. Not having to deal with Shaman is pretty nice. And on the other hand, not having to deal with the flexibility that is Warlock makes sense to me as well. Yeah, Paladin is one of those classes that every single player entering the tournament has to be prepared in some way, either to build their lineup to beat it or or let's just uh, try to maybe ban it out. But here it seems that uh, these players are, are feeling comfortable playing against it, and uh, they do have a lot of good class, and that's what we're going to start out with. Paladin on Paladin action. And it's not just Paladin versus Paladin, because that's still a little bit vague. I know D2 has asked me in between the break, <laughs> what do you think the chances are someone brings out a Murloc Paladin? I, I think it's above zero, but I don't think it's very likely given both of these two MOs. The first is that if you look at David C, you look at him as a player that hasn't proven himself at all. And when you're on that stage for the first time, and you know, to be honest, you do get nervous, you have to go with something very safe and what you feel like is your best chance. And that's like a secret paladin, druid, you know, zoo warlock lineup that we've been seeing. Tyus, on the other hand, he's also been a big fan of secret paladin, so it doesn't surprise me that they're bringing these kind of decks. Yeah, it was quite an interesting decision from It's Me David C to keep that redemption in the starting hand without a two drop, but he did find one. There's a shield and minipot, so if that minipot was to die right now, it would just come back to life and get the trade it wants with the juggler. It's possible his deck is kind of centered around that, right? Maybe he has Haunted Creepers. He obviously, we see the Blessing of Kings in there, so maybe his entire strategy is focused around making sure that he has stuff on the board that he can eventually buff later on. Yeah, I mean, we've seen some of those uh, double double Belcher decks with double redemptions. I believe Hoei was one of the players that was kind of doing well with that type of list some time ago. So uh, it could be that, because if you're only running one redemption, it's kind of hard to keep, because you know that your Mysterious Challenger is going to get one less secret. Wow, that's redemption paying off big time for David. Yeah, yeah. Ty's not expecting that at all, and you can see the grimace in his face when that came out. I mean, he wanted to avoid something like a, basically, you know, an avenge going Avenged, off, or even yeah. a way to buff it, like the Blessing of Kings in the hand right now from Mismi David C. I mean, decent play by Tice, if you think about it, because he's giving up his Knife Juggler, but it could have prevented a Blessing of Kings in the situation. Unfortunately, got a bit punished. Yeah, I mean, definitely from Tice, he was expecting to see Avenge. You wouldn't think that the card that he kept in his starting hand would have been a, would have been a redemption. I wouldn't have expected that, but a great, uh, great call from David to keep that and was able to surprise Tice. And uh, here's the Kings. What's so amusing is that even though this ended up being something that Tice didn't want to see, it works out conveniently well because he has an Iron Beak Owl. And it's not only the Owl that's really effective against this strategy, but Tice also saw the coin, which one of the only advantages of being able to go second in this mirror matchup is you have the coin. Because the, usually the thought is whoever can get that Mysterious Challenger is in a huge advantage. And so Tice not only is going to be able to deal with his first threat, but there's no threat of a turn 5 challenger, meaning his turn 6 challenger is going to have even more impact. Yeah, that's the Iron Big Owl, absolutely huge here. Good thing for Tice that he had access to it. Other, otherwise, it would have been extremely difficult to deal with that I mini, but when it was th that big. I mean, 6-5 Divine yeah. Shield, oh my goodness. I mean, choose over champion, one of the best things you can ever ask for, Ooh. but it wasn't effective on that board at all, and yeah. thank goodness DVC picked up that Shredder, because <laughs> otherwise his play was terrible. Yeah, that was absolutely huge for him to pick that up. Like you said, choose over does absolutely nothing there. Looking at Tyus' situation, though, it's still pretty good. He has Lothab into Mysterious Challenger. That's pretty good. That's what you want when you're going in the mirror. Yeah, both players curving out quite nicely right now. The advantage that was uh, mentioned earlier is that uh, like you said, it thrown on that the coin is now gone, so Tice is going to be the player to get to play the Mysterious Chancer first, and that can be a huge swing. And another thing, too, is that David C is playing a very defensive form of the, uh, the Secret Paladin. We saw the Voucher, for example, and therefore it picks up worse trades in almost every department. 
And if Tice plays his cards right, he's going to have a pretty decent board for when the Mysterious Challenger hits to have a very good competitive spirit board to close out the game. Because another thing is, it's just like any kind of mirror matchup. If you have the board, you the person has to trade into you, and you can go face and just race from that point on. That's right. And we can see it here that uh, David already down to 19. Been the, even a couple of more points probably coming in. I would not expect for Dice to be trading. Oh, he might huh. trade. But he does also have that uh, Noble Sacrifice up. Yeah, no Doomsayer this time. <laughs> no Doomsayer. I mean, a little bit confusing to me as well, especially because you want as many minions onto the board to be able to distribute all those buffs out, but I guess he doesn't want to have that four attack on the board to be able to, like, basically trade with a lot of his minions. Yeah. Rupenta's getting great value there. It's a god that sometimes might not get all that much done if your opponent just plays a small minion into it, but here, five damage for basically three since you, he pulled it out of the out of the Mysterious Juncture. This is actually quite close to lethal right now. Yeah, he has to calculate for Noble Sacrifice and how things calculate from there. If it absorbs the weakest hit, I think he's one off. Yeah, I believe he's one off. But you still want to go for this because Divine Shield and Cog Hammer is really powerful as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> weakest target, but ah, I guess, you know, you don't have to worry too much about it. You're in such a firm lead. And, you know, even though your follow-up hand is not that great, you're still in a great position to close out the game. I mean, hitting the smallest minion is actually not too bad if you think about it. It's kind of like an Annoia try and right? You need to have three different attacks in order to get through to the big minion. So sure. I'm sure Tice doesn't really mind this too much. Yeah, it's not all in, right? Where if your opponent had some weird way to remove it very quickly, uh, you would just be completely overwhelmed. In this case, Tice really thinking about playing a safe, trading, because again, it's not necessarily about racing and getting the guaranteed kill the next turn. You want to make sure that you can play uh, for the board, because that's ultimately going to win you majority of the games. Oh yeah, no reason not to trade. Even with that trade, he still ha has way more than enough to finish the game next time. This is kind of important too for Tice, because he just found out that there's Repentance in It's Me, David C's deck, and it looks like Tice is probably going to take this, so this will be important information for future matches as well. Yep. You know, one thing that also sticks out to me is that Tice is playing the Secret Paladin, but he also has a very interesting lineup too with like the rogue and the warrior so you know i really wonder if he's just specifically saying i'm going to target the paladin and just kind of hope that my secret paladin is slightly better in the mirror which right now it's worked out for him just well and that's game number one in the books a crucial win for our dutchman as he needed to win that to get a large advantage in the series yep well done there it's a big one to get that secret paladin out of the way now Tice is going to be looking uh, for the wins with his other two decks including the rogue that i'm really excited to see because rogue for me is one of those decks that uh that I feel like has a really high uh, skill ceiling, and you it, it really like uh, you can tell if somebody is, is very good at the deck, or or those who are not so good are probably not being bringing it. The, the, the term is inexperienced. <laughs> right, that's what I was going for. <laughs> that's what we used to uh, soften the blow a little bit. But you're absolutely right. Uh, Tice is one of those players when you when he plays Rogue. I mean, sometimes he plays it on three servers simultaneously to challenge himself. That's kind of the guy he is uh, when he's streaming. So it's really entertaining. And it's kind of like what we were talking about, right? You were saying uh, more information is being gathered, but also the Secret Paladin stays around. Therefore, Rogue becomes much better of a class. If his warrior is a patron warrior, it becomes even that much stronger. So things are already looking very good for Tys to round things up. And we're in the round of 128 still. So, you know, you definitely don't want to drop this early in the bracket because you have to play that many more games to climb back in even spot with any other opponent. Yeah, exactly. With double elimination, if you get knocked out early, there's so many matches you have to get through. And like you were just mentioning, Tyus gets the best of both worlds. He wins the match, gets a lot of information out of that Secret Paladin, has two decks that are going to be pretty good against it. So looking pretty good for him in this situation. Probably. I mean, the warrior could be a console warrior, and in that case, sure. it might can be tricky sometimes to get the full clear on those mini bots and uh, haunted creepers and that stuff. But uh, knowing Tyus, I, I think it might be patrons. Yeah, I think Patron seems to be likely. Now, I want to flip the table and focus a little bit on David and see what maybe he brought. If he happens to have a Reno Warlock, I think now would be a pretty good time to try and bust out. Paladin is already out of the way. There's the Patron Warrior, potentially, or even Control Warrior. And there's that Rogue. So if you feel very confident in those matchups, it might be the time to bring it out. Although Druid's never really the bad pick either. Sometimes Druid can just go ahead and do things, even though it has, quote, weak matchups. It's not completely awful. That's he just fun. goes ahead and gives a Paladin again, <laughs> though. I mean, why not? Yeah, Druid is one of those classes that doesn't really have any, like, truly undoable matchups. Matchups like, for example, uh, one of the the most uh, one-sided matchups might be the control warrior against freeze mage. But Druid has none of the matchups like that where it would be completely hopeless. One matchup that can feel hopeless is if Paladin gets overwhelmed by Rogue very early. Tice not only has 
early game tools, like Fan of Knives, like Backstab, but he also has access to the coin with Violet Teacher. So this could be pretty nasty. If you saw, uh, you know, a snowballing game with Sixo getting the cards that he wanted against his opponent, I mean, Tice might be in the same position. Yeah, the backstab is absolutely huge. Tice would love to have uh, something like a preparation also to go with it. Maybe a minion for next turn, but just looking at it as it is, not too bad. Rogue is also one of those classes that really like having the coin to be able to combo things off. So. So uh, while some other decks, maybe you would rather go first with, with Rogue, it's uh, it's pretty good to go second. What do you think about maybe attacking the Haunted Creeper here, just to maybe weaken it a bit and then use the Fan Knives in the next turn? Definitely an option. He chose to not do it here just yet, probably planning yeah. to coin out that teacher. Well, this um, is a, there's a yeah. lot of side things to what... Or let's just go ahead and say mm. layers. There's a lot of layers to the play that Ty's made. If you attack into the Haunted Creeper, you really signify that you have Fan of Knives, which a lot of times you don't want your opponent to actually think about. In fact, sometimes Paladins are on autopilot so much that they'll just play Muster for Battle <laughs> directly on turn three and get Fan of Knives, and that's how you get blown out of the game. Oh my goodness, that Repentance might be so huge here. <laughs> wow, the teacher I don't think he's expecting this at all. No. And yeah, he already shakes his head seeing yeah. the bad news. Is Dice is not happy about this. Violet Teacher, one of those minions that can be extremely difficult for the Paladin to deal with. As a lot of the, lot of uh, cards, like for example, the True Shield Champion only deals four damage. Still not the worst turn though. I mean, he's able to clear out this Knife Juggler, get out of one one. Will he? Will we see the second backstab and clear out one of the Spectral Spiders? I mean, I, I think I might go for this in this turn. It depends because backstab still has applications even beyond this turn. Backstab against, you know, even the Pilot Shredder allows you to help clear it for the following turns. And also, if you commit too much on the board and they Consecrate, then you lose almost everything as well. It's yeah. all about what you think this backstab can do now versus later. It's a close call. He might pick up something like Assai Agent from the top, and then having that backstab would be an excellent way to combo it off. Uh, also, backstabbing that right now, it wouldn't clear the board. Even with the weapon, it, it, there would still be one, one, one remaining, so mm. that Violet Teacher is going to die. I, I kind of like keeping the backstab for now. There will certainly be a good time for it later on. I guess the question is, is mm. Tice just completely stuck on making sure that he doesn't have, or he, he doesn't really have a play on turn four that's very clean. So he's definitely looking for a minion. Meanwhile, in David C's camp, he's got some interesting choices. He could, do, he could play Shredder, which is the most proactive, but he also can play something that's a little bit more board preservation. So I think he's really evaluating his choices here and what's mm. the best. I like the Shredder a lot. There's no better time for it than turn four. And maybe this is what Sykes was thinking about when he didn't backstab last turn, right? He was expecting something like a Shredder coming out now, so now he can use the backstab to pretty good effect in this situation. That's true. Oh, yeah. There it is. Preparation just to turn yeah, one a turn. little too late. <laughs> late. Although, I mean, if you still had the knowledge that it's repentance, would you have gone all in on the prep? That's something that you have to evaluate as well. That's a lot of 1-1s. One I don't know. <laughs> it's nice it is. Oh, that's a little bit annoying. Tice was hoping for a mm. two toughness minion there. And uh, there's a. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to enrage that for now. No, let him deal with that. And with the uh, Amani Berserker, and you know, now that he has a pretty reasonable sized board in preparation for Mysterious Challenger, I mean, Tice still needs a little bit more here in order to clear and be safe from just getting overwhelmed by the board. Yeah, and this entire time, Tice looked like he was in a good spot, but now he's facing a pretty big board that he can't really deal with right now. So, I mean, this just shows the power of Seeker Paladin. Sometimes he just overwhelms you, even against a rogue. Yep, Tice does have that flurry in his hand ready and waiting, but he still needs either Deadly Poison or the Oil to, to get the required extra bits of damage for the flurry. All right, so when David C pulls out, uh, how many secrets? I mean, probably four, because yeah. he already had the Repentance mm -hmm. and Whilst two Repentances in a Secret Paladin deck is not not very <laughs> likely, it's not impossible either. We've Just seen some people put some weird stuff. Just put Eye for an Eye, put Sacred Trial, why not? I mean, it's a very classic PTSD mm. thing to, to talk to someone who's been through Ladder a lot to <laughs> say, like, they've seen everything. They've seen Eye for an Eye, they've seen Sacred Trial, they've seen, you know, Lay on Hands in Secret Paladin decks. It's like, it's almost, <laughs> like, everything is on the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> David really thinking about his options here. Yep. Usually... The mysterious challenge is uh, referred to as Doctor uh, Doctor Six by some because if you have it on, on turn six, you are likely to play it. But uh, here, the kings, it's it's actually not looking too bad. It would help a lot with the Belcher. 
I mean, Blessing of Kings is always a really good option, obviously, but I just can't imagine you just don't push down the Mysterious Challenger here. It makes it so your deck is so much thinner, you're only drawing good cards, but looks like he's gonna go for that Blessing of Kings. And to be fair, I mean, Tice didn't have a way to do with it last turn. If you're in It's Me David Seed's position, you're thinking, well, he didn't. He couldn't deal with this last turn. Very unlikely that he deals with this this turn, and maybe I can put more pressure on and then drop Dr. Six after my board's been dealt with. Yep. He, he also willingly takes damage onto the Knife Juggler, which means he's preserving health overall to the board. And yeah. I really, I'm really curious because Rogue's not really known for dealing chunks of damage in like three. You know, they can do the yeah. backstab the SI7. So I, I'm interested because I think even if his opponent, he had like, he was playing against Flurry, just, just a basic Flurry would clear the board and that would make Mysterious Challenge really weak. So. This is an interesting line of play. Sibis, what do you think? I, I'm almost really, uh, also uh, really curious about the, about the reasoning behind that play, because it seems so convenient that you can get the Amani right. easily enraged there. Yeah, Ro Rogue doesn't really have convenient access to Consecration. They have to have the Deadly Poison and the Blade Flurry, and a weapon up, too. Who am I? Oh. Yeah, I, I think it's what, you're, what was talk he was going through before, right? Is that he saw that there wasn't any Blade Flurry, so if he doesn't have Blade Flurry, if he deals with my Knife Traveler there, it's kind of okay with it. Even though the Imani doesn't get buffed, it's really hard to deal with going forward, so I think that's kind of what he's thinking about right now. Right, and there's the, the <coughs> Mysterious Challenger finally coming down. Uh, Thai is already down to 16 HP. He needs to find a way to uh, to ease off the pressure. Yeah, and with 10 damage onto the board, uh, and you expect 14 from the competitive mm. spirit, Thai has to figure out a way to try to minimize damage and survive. Because I mean, he has some pretty good tools to try even gain control of the board. And you can also see that Thai is playing Doctor Boom. This is a, a variant of Oil Rogue, popularized by Mr. Yagut, who really tried to play for immediate tempo and board control and have Dr. Boom be one of the finishers that Rogue sometimes likes. Yeah, I like the decision a lot to, to bring that Ooh. gun. This is a powerful one. Oh, oh, right. That is really big because now he can flurry and sap yeah. and basically get rid of the board here. Oh. I mean, that, that that's what really keeps Tyson in this game right now. Um, I guess the only nice thing is that David C still has plays following this turn because other than that, besides this mysterious challenger, he didn't really have much going on. It's true. There's not many secrets left for David. That's the last event in his hand right now. The Repentance was already played. So maybe a Noble Sacrifice then? Yeah, only a Noble Sac, I think. Because uh, we also saw in the previous match that he was in the end only running one Redemption. So, so hmm. this is interesting for Tice because he knows that there's a competitive spirit up, so he really wants to just get rid of as many minions as possible. Maybe he lets it go onto the Shield of Mini bot, but I mean, if ever Tice just keeps clearing the board, clearing the board, then it's me, David C. can just drop the muscle for battle. There's not going to be much AoE left. Yeah, tough spot for Tice. He knows that after a competitive spirit, there is going to be 10 power on the board, so something like a true silver champion would give David the lethal, but Tice knowing that there's not really any other option, he is oh. going to take the risk. I think I saw a blessing of kings. Oh, wow. That's going to wrap it up. You know, Rogue was supposed to try and take out the Secret Paladin, and Tice is not going to be happy to see that. It's one of those super volatile decks. You saw that Tice got almost a oh, every card he wanted outside of the preparation, and yet Secret Paladin was still able to overwhelm him. Uh, you know, David with also some interesting choices, not playing the Mysterious Challenger, which is something that people always look at on turn six. Like, that's what you want to do. But his line of play ends up working out for him anyways. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. It, got, it worked out really well for David there. I think the key moment in the game was that repentance on the teacher early on, because Violet Teacher is one of those cards that can sometimes just run away with the game against the Paladin. Can be extremely difficult to remove, but now with that repentance, it was easily dealt with, and uh, Tyson didn't really have more minions to play afterwards. Yeah. Such a huge win, too, because with that Paladin win, that means now he has Druid and uh, the Warlock remaining, and uh, w w now that Paladin's escaped the wrath of you know the Rogue <laughs> and the... And Potentially the patient warrior combination here. Uh, I feel like David's chances just improved dramatically in the series. Yeah, in both last hero standing and in conquest, if you can get an unfavored matchup win, it really boosts your chances overall. Even mirror wins are really, really good for you. So, like you said, I mean, it doesn't have to face the wrath of you know the rogue just kind of pounding on it and 
those unfavored matchups, does have the Druid and the Warlock, and depending on what this Warlock is, he might have favored matchups the rest of the way. It's true, because Warlock still remains one of the most flexible classes in Hearthstone. We talk about the Zoo Warlock, which we, just, we saw earlier in the previous series. There's also the Reno Warlock, one of your favorite decks that oh, beats yeah. it in recent times <laughs> because of its flexibility. Uh, and of course, the last deck that's always often forgotten until people see it is the Malagos Warlock. People see that. I know Purple is a big fan of it, because that's what he won DreamHack with uh, most recently in winter. So, uh, still a very fluid class and that's what really ultimately brings a lot of complexity on Tice's end right because he's a player that's well documented people know Tice's MO is to play freeze mage is to play druid is to play decks like the patron warrior but with a guy like David C you don't have information on him so how do you prepare exactly for it you just have to take what the best chances are and you go from there. I think for Mulligans, like you expect the zoo. Looking at the other classes that uh, David was bringing, there were some uh, aggressive choices, especially the Shaman. So, wow, it seems like it is a zoo, but it's a little bit of like a slower version with the, with the white colors. The mid range zoo, right? Where they call it Demon Zoo, another way to, to talk about it. It's definitely slower than what people are playing these days. People have gravitated towards the old form of Zoo where you don't really have Malkanis or those big demons and void callers. Just go for a lot of board and, and, and aggression on the board. Very similar to how a lot of boards like to tempo aggressively as well. Yep, there was a moment in time where uh, where a lot of the Zoo decks were the, the void caller version, but in the recent uh, times it, it hasn't been the case. Yeah, and for Tice here, he it was a reasonable risk for him to take, right? If he was going at something like a Reno, he'd be a bit behind, but realizing that the Patron is good against Druid is decent against Zoo as well, so pretty good decision here for Tice to bring up the Patron in this situation. Void here is one of those cards where I really love seeing it whenever it can just completely <laughs> blow the game out, but there's also times where Void Caller doesn't do anything. In fact, it sabotages your tempo. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm very split on this card. What do you guys think? Because that's a very interesting choice, in my opinion. For Void Caller or Void Terror? Void Terror. My, did I say Void Caller? I that's the second time you said Void Terror. Oops, void I apologize. But yeah, Void Terror, I mean... That purple card right there on the, on the screen. <laughs> that one. It is pretty amazing, especially in this particular situation wow. when you can make a massive one. It's me, David C, going full greed mode here, playing the Haunted Creeper on turn three, and he's going to get rewarded because he's going to get a massive Void Terror out here. Yeah, I mean, it can get cleared, but it's difficult. It, now Tice has to go out of his way to kill this. Yep, Tice does have an execute for that 7-7, seven, seven, but it's uh, <laughs> that's such a huge spot on turn four. Well, there are multiple ways to do this from Tyson's end. With two executes, he can definitely feel comfortable pairing with one. Does he feel even comfortable taking that damage and waiting a turn? I, I mean, think he's going to clear and then go with the inner rage and execute. Uh, or clear the Nurubian, excuse me. Yeah. The only way to not, to not take the damage from that, uh, take the seven, would be to use either the whirlwind or the inner rage to. Uh, to uh, damage that for the execute. So I think it makes a lot of sense. Just ignore it for now. Next turn with the Death Spite, Death Rattle, you're gonna get it damaged anyway, and then that's going to be the time for the execute. Well, yep. I, what I love about this play too, it gives him that opportunity just in case he draws a Grim Patron next turn. Then all of a sudden, I mean, there's gonna be some mustaches yeah. flying on the board <laughs> because it, it'll be an insane amount of patrons coming out with the fact that you clear the board and his best minions are one attack creatures. So was, from that position, Grim Patron can often dominate the board so much that it, the game's over. So, you know, Tice gives himself this two out of, I, I wanna say like 23, 22 cards remaining in his deck. That's an opportunity for him to win the game. Yep, he does not have the Patron yet, but it would have been an amazing draw. Oh, does not get it. Another Whirlwind. Whirlwinds are great, but not right now. I have a question about sequencing here. So you attack the Void Caller, and let's assume that it just goes ahead and does that. He, he, he pulls out the Doom Guard. Would that actually damage the Doom Guard with the no. Whirlwind or no? It did not get damaged. Yeah, because the, the uh, Death Spike came out first, and then it, the Death Battle orders matter in this situation as well. So yeah, it would not damage it, so we'd have to damage it once more. So this is why Tice is going for this. Also, obviously, just gets a kill off those Spectral Spiders, which can be pretty annoying. Absolutely, and I think if with that kind of knowledge, Tice doesn't want to be stuck in a position where he would have an overwhelming you know, like say it was Malganis in the worst case scenario. All of a sudden you have nine damage coming your way, you might die the following turn. Yeah, exactly. And he really Oh, <laughs> oh. Wow. What wow. Huge draw. This is massive, yeah. But the the prior turn, Tice really prioritized getting that Lotha belt. He didn't want to waste time dealing with, you know, whatever big minion would come out, but now he has to deal with it. But he does have ways to deal with it. The whirlwinds and the the execute allows him to cleanly deal with almost everything. In fact, I, I think he has enough mana to do everything he wants. 
Yeah, he can get a full clear here, but the real issue is that that, that is the last to execute for Thais. And for next turn, there yeah. is going to be a, a Dr. Boom coming from David. Obviously, from Thais's point of view, you can't really play around the Boom right now. You can't try to keep an execute. It doesn't get much better than a Doom God with the execute. One of the big problems, too, is that this Warrior deck is completely dependent on making sure that you can use its combo pieces for the right things. And if you're forced to use Whirlwind or Inner Rage, you know, in your Death Spite without combining it with Grim Patron or anything else, you're just going to be stuck with almost no resources because your draw cards are really dependent on those things activating on your minions as well. Exactly. On turn five, turn six, turn seven, if he had drawn that Grim Pigeon, he would have had infinite resources, just all Grim Pigeons spawning left and right. But like you say, only the combo pieces and no Grim Pigeons, no way to utilize those combo pieces, just has to get rid of the minions. And now, just in a really horrible spot here for Tice. Yeah, it's a common problem with all the combo decks. Uh, that can happen. Like Sometimes you just don't fight, find the center piece. There is opportunity to board clear, but I think Tice doesn't want to commit that much. And he also has to calculate, you know, what are his chances to win, even? It, you can always play keep away, but Warlock will be life-tapping on a very high amount of health, and therefore drawing more cards. You're just going to be in a tough position from this turn going forward. Uh, Tice Whoa. going man mode. Yeah. He I mean, tank the Dr. Boom. I think this is the only way he could have killed it, other than using the Inner Rage as well as his uh, his Fire at Warwick. So yeah. just going to go for this, and he's going to die this turn, unfortunately. And it's me, David C., taking a 2-1 lead. Not only taking a 2-1 lead, but winning two matchups that I don't think he was considered the favorite in. And this is a really big opportunity for David C. to close out the series against what people consider one of the strongest, if not the strongest, player in Europe. Yeah, that was that was so huge. Finding the win with the Warlock, not only winning a game, um, the Druid is, is in a much better position against the decks that Thais is remaining. That's right. So it's not looking good for our European champion <laughs> from 2015, but that's the way the cards go. You just have to deal with it, and that's kind of what... The, the beauty is of this system in general, you get to see other players from other regions challenge without necessarily having to fly, you know, and, and dedicate everything. I mean, David C is local to Romania, and I know that scene in, Har uh, the Hearthstone scene in Romania, uh, there's a lot of players that really like to sign up for those tournaments and try their hand. And it's not just them, but, you know, look at guys like RDU, uh, Tyson's teammate, once upon a time, an unknown player from Romania, also getting a chance to take down big names. Yeah, exactly. It's really awesome to see all these players, you know, getting a chance to be able to play here. There's so many players. I mean, you and I, we know so many players that are kind of grinding every single day that maybe the public doesn't know. And it's really good to see some of these players, you know, showcase their skills. And yeah. so far, it's, it's me, David C., playing really well in this situation. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that we don't really know anything about David C. outside of his username and also that... Uh you know, he, he's, he's playing the lineup that he is. So uh, with that, I, I mean, I know a lot, Tice has a lot of fans recently who's really starting to come into his own, both as a brand, as a player. But uh, he's on the ropes here. So what does he need to do to turn this around here, so he's in your opinion? He needs to... Uh he needs to get a solid draw with the Rogue against that Druid. I, it, it can go either way. I think Druid is like slightly favored usually by the statistics, but a lot of Rogue players say that uh, it's a good matchup for the Rogue, so it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the joke between every single Rogue player. They yeah. feel like they're good against every matchup, and if not, it's just because you're bad. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what they say as a joke. Uh, going over into the Warrior vs. Druid matchup, this is definitely, at least on paper, Tice is better option. You look at Warrior and Druid, and it feels like Warrior still has that opportunity. Sure, you lose that Frothy Berserker Warsong combo from back six months ago. However, you still have that threat of Grim Patron Flood that Druid still has a hard time clearing. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? Because since the Warsong nerf, Grim Patron has actually gotten better against Druid because they have those mid-range minions. And on the other hand, you know, one of the ways that Druid was able to actually beat Patron is just to get rid of all their threats in the olden days. But now that's really not the case anymore. Right, this is the good matchup for Dice here. Staking the, his better deck against the, against the Druid first. Knowing that the Druid generally struggles dealing with all those Patrons. The AoE of Druid is the swipe. And <laughs> how do you swipe the Patrons? You usually just end up spawning more. I like this weapon equip from Dice. He knows that he doesn't have a second weapon, so he's going to preemptively equip something just in case of an innervate. He sees his opponent has the innervate as well. This allows him to have relevance for the slam. And ultimately, if he picks up one way to activate the Grim Patron with a Whirlwind effect, he might be in business because he can do it on turn 5 or turn 6. Depends on what he draws in the next couple turns. Yeah, equipping the axe worked out so well because he wouldn't have had 4 mana on turn 3, obviously. Mm -hmm. 
had an easy way to deal with that Drake right now. When, when Ty saw the innervates come out, he wasn't happy about it, but the Drake yeah, was still quite a relief. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, if that was a Druid of the Claw, I would have had a tough time dealing with it. He could have possibly used the Inner Race to clear it as well, but I mean, this this uh, Dread Corsair is pretty nice for him, pretty good pickup, but you know, you saw Tyson's face. He was not happy seeing the second Inner Rate come up there. Yes, yeah. certainly not. There's also an interesting amount of choices that we didn't really talk about uh, at the beginning of this game. Tyson had Armor Smith, and he also threw that away. Why, why do you think he threw that Armor Smith away? Is it because he had the Fiery War Axe? Uh, he wanted to go for something, uh, something that he, he uh, thought was like more valuable. Like, Armorsmith, while it can be nice, it's it's good with battle rage. You might find ways to to clear to, to uh, draw multiple cards with with that combination. It doesn't really contest that much. Living roots, yeah, I can kill the one ones, but other than that, it's not really game breaking. What's much more important is to have those uh, those uh, weapons and and the Grim Patron for uh, for their turn five or six. Yeah, Makes and he was he was also kind of planning out his turns, right? On turn two, if I armor smith, turn two, I fire warax. I mean, at that point, you really just want to get set up for your your death bite, especially if you have patrons in hand. So everything was just really awkward if he went for the line of play of keeping the armor smith. So it definitely makes sense for him to just toss it there. Ooh, David is at a crossroads. Does he kill off this acolyte or risk a your mode. opponent being yeah. able to punish you a lot? You yeah. know, thankfully, he does end up yeah. killing it. The right decision to clear it off for sure. There's so many things that we would have went wrong if he didn't. We, we can see that there was an inner rage, battle rage. Tice could have drawn a lot of cards with the acolyte. That's might not a bad draw at all. In fact, that's probably what Tice was hoping for the best at that case yeah. because now he has a way to activate the second wave of patrons. And this is the point where you cross say, please, no Harrison Jones! Because <laughs> that would have just destroyed Tice at that point. The Harrison is not there and uh, all, he, all David had for his turn 5 was a shade, and that shade, if Tice picks up a whirlwind, he could even clear it. You still go for this Grim Patron, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You want to flood the board, put the answers right in your opponent's face, and they need to specifically have the good response, which it looks like he, he does have a good set of responses, right? Yeah, he should be able to clear all of it, actually. With the living roots right, right. and the swipe, that actually should be a pretty clean way to remove, but again, that takes Drew's entire turn, and you have a follow-up play as the warrior to, re to take a board that's, to be honest, even stronger than the patrons. You have the Shredder and the Folly Berserker, very threatening stuff. Yeah, that's kind of why this patron is able to deal with Druid much better than it used to, right? Because, you know, your patrons get cleared, now you can actually do something afterward. And as you can see here, this feels good for Ismi DMC to clear this board, but now Tai's just coming back with pretty strong minions here. Yep, really solid turn from Tice. He could go for the Frothing Shredder, that would be very efficient. He could also try to like go Grim Patron on Stable Ghoul, but that's a little <laughs> bit too risky because it is the last Grim Patron. Do you like setting up a Stable Ghoul for the Grim Patron though? Like what if you play the, sh the, the Shredder and the Unstable Ghoul? Is that too greedy to set up things? I and think not you save efficient? it. Because it's so mana efficient that it's much more power to just play those uh, bigger minions. The Grim Patron, there's no way he can play it right now. Because he, he has to make sure to, to spawn extra patrons. On the oh, oh, he's going for wow. the ghoul. But you know what this also does? It sets up for Battle Rage as well. That's true. And his, he's mm. getting really low count on the cards. Yeah, and he just saw a broth, so that might actually survive. So uh, Tice can go for the patrons wow. right now and attack with the ghoul. Look at Tice. He, he's nodding there, realizing that was exactly the play that he was expecting there. Just shows how much he's really preparing for this and how much he thinks about every single turn going forward. Didn't just plop down the frothing and, and the shredder like we were saying. Yeah. He really thought through his turn. Yeah, that worked out well. He, he, he didn't know that the Druid was coming to turn to turn 7, yeah. which usually means either Lore or Dr. Boom. Uh, yeah, it looks like Davis, he's going to need a lot more than just one big game hunter to deal with these incoming threats. And the best part for Tice is that he gets to refill his hand with potential follow-up threats. There's one of them, Gromosh Hellscream, with a Whirlwind. So if he can land like all of the damage, that is potentially game-ending damage the following turn. That's effectively well, the two mana screens <laughs> right there. Yeah. The nice thing for Ismi Davis, see, though, he doesn't, he doesn't even need to use the big game hunter. He can go with this Drake uh, okay, and double right. living rune. So yeah, that's yeah. pretty good for him here. That's not what you're expecting, though. You saw Wrath, you saw Swipes. <laughs> but yeah. two living roots for three damage. It's okay, though, because I think, um, you know, Tice was like, oh, he's going to swipe me. But, yeah, the, the, the Living Roots here was an interesting keep as well. That's something that we didn't discuss. Davis, he chose to use Swipe instead of the Living Roots Hero Power, but it ends up not really having too much of a difference, I think. Yeah, it worked out all right. He could have uh, also, instead of the Wrath, he could have used one of the Living Roots earlier. He wanted to keep that, and mm -hmm. it seemed to kind of pay off. 
We're getting into the point of the game where every single turn Tyus has to be worried about combo. So how defensively does he play? This could be, you know, his tournament on the line, at least the first part of his tournament on the line if he loses here. So how risky is he going to play? It's going to be really interesting to see going forward. I still like the plan of drawing cards for Tyus. Not to mention the synergies across the board with it. Grim Patron getting copied. You have an opportunity to draw a card. Uh, and you still have some really good follow-ups with Gromash and Lotha. That's something that you're always afraid of as the warrior. On Druid's end, no sign of the Force of Nature Savage Drawer and no sign of drawing cards. So in a lot of ways, you're stuck with, with the hand that you have. However, you're behind on the board. And that means Druid has to fight from a very awkward position from this point forward. Now this is going to be kind of weird for Thais to, to close out this game. He does have that Chrome, which can uh, give him some burst, but the Druid's still at 32 and with these patrons getting dealt with, it's uh, well, kind of getting, almost getting dealt with. It might be tough for Thais to have uh, what it takes to kind of sustain. Huh. That's a really interesting choice as well. You know, a little bit greedy from David Zen to like, <laughs> ah, yeah. well, it's not the, that big health patron, but what if he has, you know, another... An unsilenced. No. <laughs> well, I mean, if he has, like, another whirlwind ability of some kind. Right. Well, if he, the thing is, if he just killed off the 3-2, then the 3-3 three, three has, you know, a way on board to, you know, propagate itself. So I can see the decision for it from its me saving being reasonable there. Well, if his opponent had one Whirlwind card, that would have just been devastating. The board is cleared, another yeah. patron comes up, you know, he's, he, he would be in a position where he doesn't have a board, mm -hmm. and he's out of combo range. So that would have been pretty bad. Thankfully, it didn't happen, though. And Tice is going to try to climb back on board. He picked up the Death Spite, which is also an interesting setup for how things would go. But again, his life total is something he needs to be worried about. Yep, Tice does not have the same information as we do by knowing that there's no combo in David's hand right now. Because almost every Druid does play two copies of Force of Nature and two copies of Savage Roar. So there is one of them. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there's that first Force. Yeah, Tice is going to get a little bit of information here, though. I mean, the entire time It's Me David's, he had so many cards in hand. It was really hard for Tice to put a read on his opponent. Mm -hmm. But as we see the cards coming out of It's Me David's C's hand, Tice can kind of feel a little bit safer, at least a tiny bit, knowing that, I mean, the last two cards here have to be that combo. What? Right. It's hit. really hard from this position as Druid because from this point on, based off how you play your hand, it's very obvious what you do and don't have, right? Like, yeah. in certain cases, if you can't kill your opponent and then your opponent can play around that, or say they play with the information that you don't have it, then all of a sudden, Druid <laughs> loses so much of his potency as the turns go on. So th these couple of turns from David are gonna be determining whether or not he can close this game. Yep, but if he just goes for the Emperor here, goes face with the low tap, he can set oh, no, down no. Thais to 13, so after an armor up, and with the discount on the Force of Nature, the roar would give him little, oh, goes for the trades. Uh, I don't know about this, this is, uh, Playing control. Yeah. And this is like we were talking, I mean, we saw it in the first match as well with Sixo, right? Sixo kind of, he recognized when he had to go to the, for the face and realized when he was down. And looks like Ismail David C going for the control game. I mean, you and I don't agree, really agree with it, but we'll see how it works out for him. Yeah, it might work out, but uh, remains to be seen. He also saves his Keeper of the Grove instead of, and, you know, willingly takes the damage there, just playing the value game. I, mean, I think he's really afraid of just running out of resources in case he went onto the board and Warrior was not able to clear everything. Yeah. Do you think this somehow could be a bluff, that if he has more cards in his hand, he's bluffing something like double combo or, like, single combo? I mean, whether or not it's his intention, it, it might be just a byproduct of it, too. I mean, Tyce is a player who thinks about a lot of stuff. So if you play, if you force the player on double combo, that is something to think about. And when we say double combo, we mean the fact that with Emperor Thorson discounting so many cards, you can realistically play two Savage Roars on a board full of what chargers. No. Tyce willing to cycle one card for <laughs> Battle Rage. It's one of those things yeah. where you want to try to get at least two. Oh, oh no! no. Wow. That's some bad news for Thice right now. Oh, oh my goodness. It's me, David C. can just cycle with that Battle Rage if he's getting low on cards. If Tice goes for that, that feels so <laughs> horrible right now. I mean, it is, but it isn't. Like, what if what if it's in the case where... Now, how did your opponent deal with Gromash very efficiently? He has, oh, he has, to, he has big game hunter. That's yeah, right. he, he can <laughs> damage it and BGH it, and... Mm. Yeah, there's the, <laughs> there's the oh. Dr. Boom as well, though. I wouldn't... I don't think he... I guess he could play it out right now, cause, because it's even if he isn't really in danger of dying at any point. This is all the burst that's ever in, you know, a, a Grim Patient Warrior anyways, as Gromish. Yeah, now looking at this, I actually like the line from David a little bit more than, mm. than on, on the last turn, because how many more minions can Tice even have in his deck anymore after this Grom, when it dies? 
most of his stuff is played. He played double Frothings, he played double Patrons. Did he play two Shredders already too? Lotip is played. He played like the Dread Course there. I believe he's missing a Doctor Boom in the deck. No, that would certainly help, but uh, it's going to be enough. One thing to also consider is that David, when he sees Gromosh, and he sees Dread Corsairs, and based on the way the build is, I think it's safe to assume that Tice is not playing the very aggressive one patron with cards like the Core Corn Elite that allows you to get a little bit more burst range. So, I mean, that that just does allow him to see more information, helping him make some of these decisions. Right. But David, going to play that Dr. Boom instead of big game hunting the Chromash, he could have done that by first damaging it with e either the Keeper of the Chrome or the Hero Power. Force of Nature not looking so tempting because of that Lore Worker. Do you just throw away your Lore Walker here with the Inner Rage? I don't mind that because you can activate the Dr. Boom and then <laughs> <laughs> execute it that way uh, without having to give it to your opponent. Maybe you give your your. <laughs> it looks like he's maybe gonna go for <laughs> just like, a kill. On let him die. Please, like, the Joe. please die, Joe. <laughs> is this the first time in history you hope it rolls four on one of your minions? Oh. It is so funny. Uh, maybe if you have something like a, you know, something that you want to die with a death rattle, perhaps. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you could actually just go for the inner rage and then battle rage and then you know just execute out that uh, that Doctor Boom. It's gonna go for two cards here. Looks like. You want to hear something extremely humorous? Is that you know inner rage actually extends the combo to sixteen and makes something really scary <laughs> for, <laughs> that for is right. to worry about. It's like I don't. That's true. Do, I, yeah. do I really want to give it to him? I think you kind of have to though at this point. You'd rather not yes. give your point and execute, oh. especially for this Grom. But and you know Tice because he chose a halfway point of not committing to the battle rage. He could have drawn an extra card, which could be the difference maker. Although, realistically, he's, he's drawn through a lot of cards in this deck, so it could be the point where maybe he doesn't even want to draw another card because he could be close to fatigue. Yeah, could very well be the case. And uh, <laughs> it's me, David. End up, ended up with two extra cards from that lower record, so, Joe. That's so huge. Mm -hmm. So if, if David ever picks up Savage Roar, what does he have, 17 here? Oh, he has 19. With potential of uh, even more, the the inner rage allows him. Oh, actually, with twenty, because you can hero power as well. So, there there is a lot of damage possibility, but one thing is for sure, Tice is safe for at least one more round. Oh, I, I mean, when I said seventeen, I meant without the boom bot. So, just like, oh, yeah. I apologize. Yeah, yeah, seventeen yeah. from the hand. I was counting the boom bot as well. So it's almost a foregone conclusion that he will use big game hunter onto this Gromash. Mm. Follow-up play, though, is not really that strong. Normally, you want to drop a very strong minion. I mean, this is pretty, still pretty annoying for Tice to deal with, right? Because, I mean, if you think your opponent has combo, how do you deal with this four without taking way too much damage? Almost no choice, based off Ooh. the way things go. Slam helps. Do you slam the Big Game Hunter and risk giving up cards here? It's really tough. Yeah, it really is, but he has to like this hand that Tice has right now, he it, it's not a winning hand. He, I feel like he has to draw with the slam. Also, what is Tice's win condition here? What what right. minions does he pick up yeah. to just kill the druid? It's the Dr. Boom, Boom at this point. That's about it. Yeah, I guess so. He's just going to hope that he can draw it for the following turn. And you know, he does know two of the three cards in Druid's hand. So he's yeah. at best he has one Force of Nature, one Cyrator, which is very likely to be drawn at this stage of the game because Druid's honestly very good at digging through their deck at these stages, right? You have two Azure Drakes, two mm -hmm. Ancient of Lores, you have Wild Growth for Cycles. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> yep, that's the lore. Uh, there we go. Great to pick up for David here. This might be the last turn that Tice has to turn around. Wow. Loot Horror not quite gonna turn it around. This is looking so bad for Tice. I think he has to cycle it here, played before attacking with the Death Spite. Yeah. Hoping, Hoping to find to get a Doctor. Doctor Boom. Yeah. Another chance, perhaps? Shaking wow. his head. That's not it. And he knows this is, could mm. be the, the, the this last seconds ticking down of the series. Uh, David C. has two pilot shredders and a wild growth to even go through with stuff. I mean, Tice would rather see a big minion at this point, right? Not two shredders, two medium minions that you don't really feel like you want to execute anyway. This is probably the worst board that Tice could have seen after that last turn. Probably, yeah. Almost had a card. Dr. Boom is last no. card, and I think uh, Tice knows that this is probably it. There's no way for him <laughs> to win the game. Even if this is Doomsayer, it doesn't really matter, honestly. No, yeah. it doesn't, because it, even with the Dr. Boom, David can use the Force of Nature to just uh, clear the up. 
Right. Two oh. force of nature. Not enough mana. <laughs> Double combo? Kind of? No. He's, <laughs> he still has the opportunity to, um, Is there to draw to into it. Oh, he's yeah. battle rich. So you're going to draw two cards instead of one with the wild growth. Pretty <laughs> smart from David's end. <laughs> Yeah, he can actually combo here if he picks up Savage or looks like he doesn't pick it up. But, uh, I mean, I guess maybe you play around some sort of crazy tech to brawl by not playing a Shade or something. But it's almost no matter what he does, it feels like it's a win for here for David. Yeah, there's no way for Tice anymore in this game. And what an unlikely turn of events given that Tice lineup looked pretty good against did. the setup. And if Tice, I mean, this is Tice's first match, I believe. Uh, yeah. So if, if if he drops here, that means his path to through the losers bracket is extremely unlikely. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's become be that much more difficult by adding five or so more series to play. And we talked about this a lot, but I mean, David, three unfavored matchups in a row looks like he's gonna take here. Sometimes that's just the way the cards fall. <laughs> I mean, that's just that's just what Hearthstone is. That's what card games are. And all of a sudden, an unlikely underdog is able to upset. The European Jam from 2015. He must be ecstatic right now, even though you can't Ooh, see his. There's the Doctor Pooh. A little bit too late. Doomsayer executes. One more Doomsayer. <laughs> yeah. I think he has to do it. Uh, that's his last chance. Yeah, it's still not gonna be enough, but good try. Just go ahead and boom, whirlwind. It has to specifically land onto the minions. Oh, oh, oh got one of them. <laughs> um. But yeah, it needs to somehow clear them. Yeah, yeah. that's not going to be enough. So this series is over. David C. Is this his <laughs> opportunity to start his own chapter in the Hearthstone Championship Tour? It could be. I mean, for now, people are just going to be salty because Tice is a fan favorite for a lot of these people. And they're just going to be like, yep, I knew it. You know, <laughs> I, I, I was really hoping for Tice to win. That means he loses. A lot of people put that faith in their in their horse. Uh, but who knows, man? Maybe in six months we'll be talking about this David C guy. Yeah, I mean, it's me, David C, an unknown player for most of us. But if he wants to get his name out there, this was a great start. All right. Well, uh, D2, do you have any final thoughts on this series? Like, what were some of the things that stood out to you? I mean, just overall, we were talking about Tice, his perspective, and, you know, it, how horrible it is. You know, he's losing all these games. But, I mean, David honestly played a really solid series, so I'm really looking forward to his play going forward. Hopefully, Tice can somehow make it out of that loser's draw. Yeah, I think it's also very representative of the meta game. I mean, a lot, it, it would be one thing if everyone thought Paladin was really good and just never won, or, you know, specifically the lineups around the Druid Paladin and, you know, the Zoo Warlock. That That's the lineup that we're really expecting a lot this weekend. And if it just kept losing and losing and losing, it's not very truly representative <laughs> of what it is. There, there's, there's a reason why sometimes Sixo's lineup and Tyson's lineup wins. There's a reason why sometimes the Druid, the Paladin, and the Warlock wins as well. Those are our thoughts. We're also going to head over to Aquablad, who is sitting on the other side of the tavern, to hear his thoughts as well as maybe talk a little bit about that series. Thank you, Dan. That was a massive win for David. The literal David in the Goliath battle there. He's also a, a player who we didn't know much about at first, but we've come to learn he only gained two points from Legend. And it was actually qualified for being the Tavern Hero in Bucharest. So, you know, he won a tournament to get to this point. He did beat Tice, the current reigning European champion. So, you know, a massive start for his career. He even won two bad matchups as well. So, you know, that's a big boost for him. There's a lot of games going on today guys all around Europe so if you want to keep an eye on all your favorite players be sure to check the bracket you know and see where they are and how they're doing because we won't be able to show every match so you know we're gonna be uh, keeping an eye on that bracket we got Oskaka coming up very shortly you know the current world champion so it's gonna be a very exciting game if you have any thoughts on this match that just happened or any future matches please uh, drop a message to us on social medias through Facebook or through Twitter, and we'll try and get back to you. So until the next match, uh, don't go anywhere. We've got plenty of Hearthstone coming, coming up through the day. So uh, we're going to go to a quick break, and then we'll be back soon. So see you soon.